Hey folks, and welcome back to the channel. My name's Ryan from Tragedy Tales, and over here every week, we cover the most tragic of stories. But in this week's video, we are covering 15 of the most bizarre deaths that I've covered so far. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean the worst as in macabre, but worst as in they stuck with me for quite a while after making the video. This is an extra upload this week, so stay tuned for Bizarre Deaths number 10. But without further ado, here are 15 of the worst bizarre deaths I've covered so far. Now, we all had that awkward lesson in school that in hindsight, we definitely needed. But clearly in this story, this man got no sort of lesson. In August of 2021, a 25-year-old man named Salman was spending some quality time with his partner at the Amber Hotel in Ahmedabad, a city in India's western state. Now, Salman and his partner were chronic drug users. They were addicted to sniffing epoxy glue. They would always keep this on their person and huff it for a quick kick. Now, as the two spent some alone time together, they began huffing the glue like no tomorrow. When they started getting jiggy, they realized that they didn't have any contraception. And this is when Salman had the epic idea to utilize their glue. He thought that if he was to glue his penis shut, his lady wouldn't get pregnant. What a no-brainer idea. So without much thought, he applied the epoxy glue to his member and went at it. The pair completed their mission, leading to what I can assume was a very painful climax. And that was that. However, the next day, check-in staff arrived at work early in the morning and found Salman lying unconscious in the shrubbery outside the hotel. An ambulance was called and they got him to hospital. And here they discovered the makeshift contraception. It was terrible. They could not get it off. His body had bloated and his skin was yellow. Despite a Trojan effort by the doctors, he could not be saved. He died later that night from multiple organ failure. An investigation into his death is ongoing, but it's assumed that he couldn't urinate, which led to his bladder exploding, which then led to his death. Indian officials issued a warning to all to avoid using superglue as a Johnny, but Salman's life ended in one hell of a sticky situation. This horrifying story takes us back to 1998 in the Harvest Time Bakery in a town called Walsall. Working at the bakery in 1998 was a 47-year-old man named David Mayers. He was the general maintenance man of the bakery and he would be on call to sort various jobs around the factory. Now, Harvestine Bakery opened in Leicester in 1800 and in 1998 employed over 400 people, producing bread for major supermarkets. In May of 1998, as the dough trays entered the ovens en masse, there was a sudden critical problem with one of the vast 75 foot long bread ovens. Somewhere deep inside, a grid had fallen off and the company were really worried that it would get caught up in the machinery and completely ruin the insides. So they had to get it fixed. Now at first, they did consider getting a specialist to dismantle the oven, but in the end, they decided that they would repair it in-house. They asked if David could accompany the engineer through, something that he had never been asked to do before. He didn't really want to do it at first, but the company offered a tantalizing bonus for doing it. So he eventually agreed. That fateful morning, at approximately 9 a.m., David arrived at work and met with two engineers. One senior engineer overseeing everything and one engineer that would be entering with him. When the trio arrived that morning, it had been baking bread all night. So the first thing they did was switch it off and wait for it to cool down. The management had been told by the ovens manufacturers that this operation should take four men at least 12 hours. However, the company would lose £1,000 for every hour the oven wasn't baking. Of course, they didn't want to lose 13 grand, so they came up with a better idea. Instead of letting the oven cool properly, industrial fans were set up around to blast cold air through. To be even more stingy, the managers decided that they could go through the entrance hatch to avoid the cost of removing the side panels, something that they would later regret massively. Just two hours after turning the oven off, at 11 a.m., Ian and David donned a thin heat protective suit, hat, and gloves 
with protected knee and elbow padding. Armed with their walkie-talkies, they carefully crawled onto the still-moving conveyor belt and let it take them inside. Just five minutes after entering, frantic screams began coming from the radio, saying that the oven was far too warm. The last thing that was heard was, get us out. In a complete panic, the engineer standing by tried to reverse the conveyor belt, but to his absolute horror, he realized it was a one-way system. There was absolutely nothing he could do. The two men had no option but to ride it out all the way to the other side. An agonizing 17 minutes later, the oven was finally broken open with the help of a crowbar and the technician was dragged out. Sadly, he was burnt to a crisp from head to toe. He collapsed and died right there on the factory floor. David, however, was nowhere to be seen. He remained trapped inside the machinery and had to be freed by the fire service that evening. An autopsy revealed that the pair had broken most of their bones and sustained terrible burns to 80% of their body. Investigators soon discovered that the oven should have been left to cool for at least 10 to 12 hours before anyone should have entered. To make it even worse, if any of them had glanced over to the temperature gauges before going in, they would have seen they read in excess of 100 degrees Celsius, enough to boil water. The two men went through hell on earth. The attention then turned to who was responsible. David's parents took the company to court, determined to get justice for their son. It's something that should never have been allowed to have happened. If, the, if their men that have accepted their responsibility who was in charge, they could have seen how dangerous it was. In court, it was ruled that the tragedy occurred because the company put productivity above safety. The company and three of its directors admitted to their part in the tragedy, each pleading guilty to two charges of failing to provide a safe system of work. Harvestine Limited and its parent company were fined £600,000 or 750000 US dollars. The managing director on shift was also fined £20,000. While Harvestine Bakery tried its best to improve its safety measures, profits sank to an all-time low and in 2005, they closed their doors for good, taking 400 employees with it. On January the 30th, 2016, it was a day like any other for two maintenance workers when they got called to an apartment building in Xi'an, China, to fix a broken elevator. They arrived at the apartments and they made their way to the elevator. It was suspended between the building's 10th and 11th floor. They peered in from above and they saw that the cable mechanism had broken. They carefully lowered themselves down and they found that it was actually a quite a big job. They decided that they couldn't be bothered to fix it that day as it was about to be Chinese New Year and like many others, the pair were eager to get back to their hometowns to celebrate. So they called it a day and they planned to return later to fix it. But just before leaving, they shouted at the elevator to check if anyone was in there. They held for a moment and silence rang out. With no response, they packed up their tools and they headed home. As they left, they turned the power off to the elevator and set another one running. They went home and thought nothing of it. 36 days later, on March the 7th, the two maintenance workers returned to the apartment to fix the cable. One stayed on the 10th floor and waited for it to lower, while one climbed on top to fix the cable. After it was fixed, they lowered the elevator to its correct position on floor 10, and they radioed in for the power to be turned on. With the power restored, the doors swung open to reveal a scene of utter nightmares. Inside the elevator was a 43-year-old decomposing woman named Wu, a resident of the apartments. She had died weeks ago. Examining inside, it was just absolutely tragic. There were hundreds of scratch marks where she had desperately tried to pry the doors open, only to find that they were in between floors. She had destroyed her hands in the process. I can only imagine what she must have gone through in that elevator. After the power shut off, it would have left her alone in the pitch black, cold and silent. If anyone had stayed home, her calls for help were likely muffled by the floor. It's enough to drive anyone insane. And with no water or food, it would have been a slow, agonizing situation to find yourself in. The news got out and questions arose. 
Firstly, why didn't her family report her missing? Well, it was reported that Wu had a mental disability and her family believed that she had just gotten lost. They did report her missing, but did not bother to look for her whatsoever. The other questions, however, are not so quickly answered. When the power was on, wouldn't she have been able to press the emergency alarm? And if so, why didn't she push it? Or was it broken? Also, why didn't she hear the men shouting initially? Another burning question is why didn't she have her mobile phone with her to call for help? Or why didn't she climb out the top safety hatch? Was it locked? This is just pure speculation, but it's almost like she was placed in there. The two maintenance workers should have opened the elevator door to check for any occupants. The residents of the flat were very angry at the management. It often took weeks for them to get back to them when problems were reported, and they blamed them for the death of Wu. The residents staged a protest against the building management, and local officials took steps to replace the people at the top. The police, however, treated the case as negligent homicide, so the pair were arrested and will reportedly face charges of involuntary manslaughter. So next time you see that elevator, maybe just consider taking the stairs. You never know, it may well just save your life. In 2007, a man named Ian lived alone in his home in Teesside, UK. Ian was an avid member of the Hardwick Baptist Church and had been for 26 years. He was an extremely skilled organist, always playing the right song for the right occasion. Despite not being professionally taught, he just had an ear for it. He was described as a friendly, kind man, always ready to give a helping hand. On January the 26th, 2007, multiple 999 calls were received stating that a loud vacuum cleaner had been running for many hours and that it was making a very loud racket. But as it was not on sociable hours, they couldn't do anything. As the night was drawing to a close, a friend that couldn't get in contact with him visited his home to check. His friend arrived at the property to find the door unlocked. They entered and they followed the sound of the vacuum cleaner. They went up the stairs to find a bizarre scene. The vacuum cleaner was attached to a large transparent plastic bag where all the air had been sucked out with brown duct tape beside. Inside the bag was Ian, naked in the fetal position. He had his shins tied with brown duct tape and his wrists were bound by a silver chain. Tragically, he'd vacuum packed himself. Police were called and they arrived at 10.40 p.m. where they swiftly turned off the vacuum cleaner and declared Ian dead. His cause of death was suffocation. Investigators found no drugs or alcohol in his system and concluded that they couldn't see how anyone forced him in there. The official statement said that Ian got in the bag himself, tied his hands and feet, and then set the vacuum going, knowing there was no way to stop it. There were no signs to show that he had intended to end his life. But of course, we can't be sure. Police believe that this was a bizarre sex act gone wrong, and they said that no suspicious circumstances were found but I'm really not sure how he managed to climb in the bag with his hands and legs tied and then managed to turn on the vacuum cleaner. This one just doesn't sit right with me. A 24-year-old man named Zafer had been sentenced to community service after he was convicted of causing wounding in Turkey. He was attending the community service, but he decided that it really wasn't for him, so he and his two friends plotted a way that they could get out of it. They thought that if he was in hospital, then he wouldn't be able to attend. So they looked around for ways to hospitalize him and they settled on the most ridiculous of ways. They decided they would shoot Safer in the back with two pillows strapped to him with a shotgun at close range. It's a well-known fact that shotguns are deadly at close range due to the spread of the inner pellets inside the casings. They can penetrate tissue, organs, and even straight through bone. So without a thought, Zafer's two friends began strapping the pillows to his back, and before they knew it, they pulled the trigger on their 12-gauge shotgun. After the shot, they spun him around to see if he was okay, but of course, he was bleeding profusely and barely responsive. They rushed him to a nearby hospital, but he was declared dead on arrival. The hospital staff phoned the police, and they shortly arrived and detained both of his friends. The two men explained to the police that they were convinced that the two pillows would stop the shotgun shell from fatally injuring him. A statement that is so bizarre, it makes it borderline unbelievable. One man was eventually released, while the 18-year-old man who pulled the trigger was sentenced. But I was unable to find out how long for. When you're sitting in a car, eating your lunch, this is the very last thing you expect to happen. On January the 19th, 2023, it was a bright but windy day for the people of Kentucky. 
That brisk January morning, a 72-year-old woman named Lillian May Curtis got in the back of her car, driven by her daughter, to pick up her 77-year-old husband, Lloyd, from the hospital in Louisville. Lloyd had just had open-heart surgery and was being transferred to another hospital for recovery. Lillian was described as the family's matriarch, loving and caring, just like all grandmothers should be. They safely got to Louisville, picked up Lloyd with no problems and made their way back home, with Lloyd in the passenger and Lillian still in the back. While they were driving on the way back, a severe thunderstorm warning was issued for the state of Kentucky and as they made their way home, the wind got more and more aggressive. The trio soon found themselves driving through 40 to 60 mile an hour gale force wind. Trees were shaking and some were even uprooted. The wind is insane, I've never seen this much wind. At around 1.30 p.m., they decided to pull off the highway and stop to eat. They had the choice of a rustic pizza place or a White Castle, but the other restaurant there was a Denny's, and they soon decided to go there. They ordered their food and parked right beneath this very Denny's sign. Tucking into their delicious meals, the angry wind barraged the car. But what happens next is right out of a horror film. All of a sudden, the strong wind broke a metal support on the Denny sign, situated directly above them. All captured on video, you can see the 2,600 pound sign come tumbling out of the sky. It landed on the car, completely decimating it. In amongst the twisted metal and shattered glass, Lillian's daughter and her husband were injured, sustaining concussions and broken ribs. However, when they glanced into the backseat of the car, Lillian had not been so lucky. The sign had impacted the rear of the car. It hit the car exactly where Lillian's head was, crushing it completely. The sign was very heavy. A large recovery team came in and had to use a crane to get it off the car. Lillian was rushed to hospital where surgeons tried to save her life. However, it was in vain. The neurosurgeon said that she had sustained a catastrophic head injury and it was inoperable. Lillian had died. The doctor said that her death was instantaneous and that there was no way her body could have felt any pain. Just four days later, Lloyd also died in the hospital from what they believe was injuries sustained from the sign, bringing the 50-year marriage to a tragic end. Her daughter started a GoFundMe for the funeral service, reaching almost double the goal than originally requested. This was an entirely avoidable tragedy. It's not fair to be on this planet for 80 years to be taken from a Denny sign. I hope her family gets the compensation they rightly deserve. If you're going to make a huge 2,600 pound or 1.3 ton sign, you have to make sure it's safe and maintained. However, it seems in this case, they didn't, and it cost two lives. The investigation is still ongoing by the Elizabethtown Police Department, as well as the city's planning department, as to how this sign was allowed to topple onto innocent bystanders below. This one had me scratching my head. It's probably one of the most bizarre deaths we've ever covered on the channel. In the late afternoon of February the 28th, 1989, in the small village of Miyakoji, Fukushima, Japan, it was the middle of winter and blisteringly cold. As the daylight began to set on that Sunday over the village of Miyakoji, a 23-year-old teacher named Yumi Tanaka left her female dormitory to use the outside bathroom. As it was election holiday, all of the students had a week off and Yumi had returned to her dormitory just two days previously. Yumi opened the door to the toilet where she was greeted with a small squatting bathroom. Not something we have over here, but apparently these are very common in the East. It's essentially where you just squat no matter what you're doing, male or female. Yumi went about her business in the poorly lit outhouse, squatting over the small toilet feature in the ground when she suddenly noticed a white shoe inside the toilet bowl. Thinking this was very strange, she stopped what she was doing and headed outside towards the septic tank. These septic tanks would naturally fill up and every few weeks, a septic truck would come and suck up all the waste. When she got round to the back of the building, the septic tank was wide open. Glancing in, she saw a pair of human feet. Yumi stopped in her tracks 
in absolute horror. She screamed and ran away from the septic tank. Yumi called the police and they quickly discovered that there was, in fact, a person stuck inside the septic tank. By just looking at the feet, it was clear it was a man. His skin was grey and white, indicating that he was clearly long gone. When the police tried to pull the man out, they found that it was physically impossible. The septic tank was just so small. He was totally jammed. It seemed that there was no way to get the man in or out without physically breaking his shoulders. So, firefighters were called and they eventually had to excavate the entire septic tank and cut open the pipe to free him. When they did, the man was identified as Naoyuki Kano, a 26-year-old man who worked as a salesman in a subcontracting job for a local nuclear plant. The teacher who had discovered him knew him locally and was shocked to discover it was him. Naoyuki was reported missing on the 24th after he failed to return home after telling his father he was going out to run some errands. When they cut open the pipe, he was found in a safety position, completely jammed. He had his knees up to his chest and was clenching his strangely clean, neatly folded jacket. He did have a pair of jeans on, but had no top clothing whatsoever. He was barefoot with only one shoe inside the septic tank. His other shoe was discovered in a dike miles away from the toilet. The police later discovered his car a short distance away with the keys still in the ignition and the doors unlocked, indicating that he had planned to return. His body was taken for a post-mortem to find out what exactly was his cause of death. He was covered in human feces and the smell was apparently so bad that he had to be cleaned thoroughly twice before morticians would even inspect him. When they did, they found his cause of death was hypothermia with compression of the vessels and nerves from being in a tight space. Due to the bad weather that week, in which it had snowed heavily, being inside a tight metal tube, this made quite a lot of sense. They stated that Naoki had no broken bones, just some light scratches on his arms and knees. Investigators then tried to explain how he got himself in this situation. This is where they came into problems. The septic tank was a U-shaped design. On one end was the toilet feature, which was impossible to climb in, and the other had an opening of just 36 centimeters, so around 14 inches, an incredibly tight entrance for any grown man to enter. Naoki was reportedly five foot seven with a shoulder length of around 16 inches, so it should have been impossible for him to enter. It's like they built the toilet around him. After his death, a Japanese documentary was made, and in this documentary, they built a replica septic tank to determine if it was even possible to get in there. As you can see, it's ludicrously tiny. They determined that he would have had to squirm headfirst into the feces-filled entrance, knowing that there was no way out. Once he got in there, he obviously got stuck, and then they say he must have curled his knees up to hug his jacket to keep himself warm. However, there's just a few things about this that don't add up. Why was one shoe not with the body? And why was the only remaining shoe near his head? Could he have possibly been running away from someone and run and hid into the toilet for safety? Who knows? Another bizarre fact that just doesn't add up was that the police specifically stated that his jacket was clean and neatly folded, indicating that he took it off and folded it inside the tank. First of all, why would he take the jacket off in the dead of winter? Why was it strangely clean? And how could he fold anything in this tight space? The police originally ruled that Nayaki was a peeping Tom who got stuck trying to peep at women. But who in their right mind would climb into a cold feces tank to do this? It just doesn't make much sense. Some people believe that a second person may have assisted him in, but then have panicked when it all went wrong. Another theory is that Nayaki had claustrophilia, the opposite of claustrophobia where one is actually attracted to small spaces. Others believe that he could have been murdered and covered up by the teacher. Some people even believe that he was murdered by his boss at the nuclear plant and that he was forced in there to look like he'd done it himself. However, his injuries indicate that he had entered on his own free will. The theories as to how he got in there go on and on and are far too numerous to list on this video. His father went on to read hundreds of legal books in the hope that one day he may be able to solve his son's bizarre death. 
But up to this very day, it remains one of Japan's most mysterious unsolved deaths. On Saturday, the 21st of May, 2021, a father and son had spent their day strolling through the cubic building complex in Santa Colma in Barcelona, when they stumbled across a large paper mache stegosaurus statue. It looked really awesome and they wanted a photo with it. It was actually left there from a promotional thing for a movie years ago and is still there to this day. The pair posed to take a picture near the statue when they were engulfed and overwhelmed by the offensive smell of rot and decay. The father looked around and identified that the smell was coming from the stegosaurus. It was coming from one of the legs. They looked a bit closer and they found a crack in the leg. Upon peering into the crack, they could make out what they thought to be a corpse of a man who had begun to decompose in the greenhouse environment of the statue. Emergency services were called to extract the corpse from the prehistoric statue and inside they found the body of a 39 year old man who had recently been reported missing. Underneath his body they found a mobile phone that was just out of reach. It seems by looking at evidence that the man had entered the statue head first to retrieve a mobile phone that he'd dropped down there. It's unsure what he was even doing to drop his phone down there in the first place but once he'd entered, he proceeded to the leg of the statue and got stuck upside down. Unable to turn around and unable to reach the mobile phone, he was indefinitely stuck. I assume he tried screaming, but yeah, you're in a dinosaur statue. No one's going to hear you. He must have struggled for a while before he was asphyxiated by the environment. He was trapped there for a total of two days before he was recovered. But some news articles say that it could have been several. The part of this story that gets me is the fact that if he was able to reach the phone, he could have called emergency services, but it's always small things like that that make me think, damn, this guy could have survived. On January the 14th, 1990, a traveller named Daniel O'Brien was at the end of a two-week dream holiday to the island of Trinidad with his travelling companion. They both had enjoyed the holiday and it came to the last night. Around 9.40pm, Daniel was reported to have gone out for a swim, and his travelling companion then got an early night. Around half an hour later, his companion was suddenly awoken out of his sleep. He looked up and it was Daniel. Daniel was now naked on top of him and strangling him. The two men struggled for a moment and Daniel knocked his companion out with a nearby lamp. With this, he ran out of the room to the hallway. Now here, for some reason, he proceeded to grab a fire extinguisher off the wall and squirted it down his throat. In a way to poison himself, I'm, I'm not really sure why, but when this didn't work, he ran to the front door of the hotel and threw it open. He looked around and here he clocked on to a nearby airport and he just suddenly decided that he had to get in there. So while he was still nude, he ran towards the wall and he literally scaled two 10-foot fences with barbed wire on top. But after scaling these fences, he was apprehended by four guards on the other side. They managed to restrain him and one stayed to inspect the fence, while the other three guards escorted him to the security office in their jeep. Now it's unsure how, but at some point in the journey, Daniel overpowered the two guards that restrained him. He then overpowered the driver and got control of the vehicle. They did try and radio for help, but before they knew it, he was driving the jeep at great speeds across the runway. He then ploughed the jeep into Airways Flight 256's wing. It was sitting at the end of the runway, engines running, awaiting clearance for takeoff. The impact of the crash sheared off the entire roof of the vehicle. Everyone watching assumed that he had been killed. But to everyone's surprise, Daniel, covered in grease, bleeding profusely from many, many injuries all over his body, clambered out of the wreckage. And before anyone could take in what was happening, Daniel did the unthinkable. He sprinted towards the plane engine as if he wasn't injured whatsoever and just like that he swan dove straight into the blades of the running engine. Now there's no need to get into detail what happened but of course there was nothing left of him. The entire left side of the plane was showered in blood and there was passengers on the plane at the time who had to witness all of this. Now he obviously wasn't acting right. He must have been suffering from an episode of sorts but sadly no one was able to stop him. An explanation of this rampage is vague, but it was reported that Daniel could not find his medication for a health condition that he had had for the past few days of the holiday. 
but in no article did it ever specify what the health condition was. When you go to the cinema or the movies for my US viewers, you go to enjoy the big screen, the popcorn and the weird fake nacho cheese that you feel a little bit guilty for enjoying, but you definitely don't expect to die. Sadly, this is what happened on the 16th of May in 2019. A 24 year old man, his wife and his son visited the local View Cinema Multiplex in Birmingham. They enjoyed the film and at the end, the man reached for his phone and his keys, only to find that they had fallen behind the seat. He thought, no problem, he raised the footrest and got on his hands and knees and instantly began worming his way under his chair. He got deeper and deeper and deeper and eventually it was just his legs sticking out. His wife was holding up the footrest and worryingly and very suddenly it got heavy and started pulling down. She tried but she couldn't hold it. The footrest hit his legs and this is when the man screamed in pain. When the footrest lowered, a mechanism within the chair also lowered and it lowered right on his neck. With the force of three quarters of a ton, his wife shouted for him to get out but he was stuck. He was screaming in pain. She desperately tried to rip off the footrest to free him but it was secured by a bolt. After four seconds of someone being in the chair, the chair was programmed to revert the headrest and footrest to the default position. To make this even worse, the controls of the seats only worked when someone was actually sat in them. When she realized this, she ran in a panic towards the foyer, screaming for help. Cinema staff rushed into the screen and they had to actually unbolt the footrest to free him. He was stuck under there for a total of 15 minutes. But when he was finally pulled out, it was too late. He had suffered a cardiac arrest. Paramedics were on their way and when they arrived, they managed to restart his heart. He was rushed to hospital, but tragically, he later died. A coroner said that the cause of his death was severe brain injuries from the swelling of the brainstem and lack of oxygen. Obviously, the cinema was heavily to blame here. A wife had lost their husband and a child had lost their father. The View cinema chain were taken to court and here they pleaded guilty. They were fined £750,000 for safety breaches which led to fatal consequences. To make it worse for them, it was found that the chair that he had become stuck in was actually missing a bar that could have allowed him to be freed by hand, but the chair had not been maintained in a correct manner and if it had been, he may still be here today. They were ordered to pay his family £130,000 for what the judge said was an accident that never should have happened. On the 8th of May 2008, an 18 year old man named Josh left his house without telling his family. Josh loved nature. He was described as extremely friendly and a lovely person. He had a carefree attitude to life and loved the guitar. His family assumed that he'd gone out for his usual walks. However, that night when he did not return, his family began to worry. Josh had been on multi-day solo hikes before, so they waited until the 13th of May five days after he disappeared to report him missing. Search efforts were conducted, but as he was over the age of 18, police had no reason to suspect a crime and therefore he was added to the missing persons list. As the search continued, they searched the wooded areas and the places he usually walked and of course there was no sign of him. The hope of finding him slowly weaned and his family hoped and prayed that he'd moved away to start a new life. Maybe he joined a band or something. They'd always hoped that he'd turn up at the door one day with a wife and kids. But sadly, years went by and he was never found. In 2015, an 80 year old builder from Colorado Springs was demolishing his old cabin in a Pinewood area, just one mile away from the family home. The cabin had not been used in over 10 years. And when the builder arrived to start work, they noticed a foul stench emanating from the cabin. But as it was in the woods, they thought it must be rodents and began demolishing it. They dismantled the chimney and this is when they made a truly nightmarish discovery. Inside, they found a man, crumpled up into the fetal position with his knees above his head. The body was very, very badly decomposed and the legs were not attached to the torso. The police were called and only with the help of dental records was the corpse identified as the 18 year old who went missing seven years previously. His family just could not believe that he was this close to home this entire time. The search that they'd conducted even went past this cabin, but there was no indication that anything was amiss, so the chimney was never checked. 
they thought that he must have got stuck trying to enter the cabin. As the decomposition was too far gone, they could not be sure on his cause of death. The coroner found no signs of trauma, no broken bones, or any injuries to his body whatsoever. His death was ruled as a tragic accident. His family and the public disputed this result. There were a number of discrepancies within the report that just did not add up. The precarious resting place of his body and the strange clues left behind confused everyone. Firstly, the cabin was unlocked and had clearly been entered. Secondly, he had been found completely naked. Apart from wearing a thin thermal shirt, his other clothes, his socks and his shoes were neatly stacked and folded by the fireplace within the cabin. And he was also found in the fetal position with his legs and knees above his head. In order to have found himself in this position, it's thought that he must have entered the chimney head first. But some say it must have taken two people to get him wedged like this. To add even more mystery to this, a very heavy breakfast bar had been ripped from the wall of the cabin and carefully placed in front of the chimney from the inside, blocking anyone from coming in or out. So officially, they claimed that he got naked, blocked the fireplace from the inside, then proceeded to climb to the roof in cold weather, no shoes, and crawled headfirst into the chimney, knowing there was no way out at the bottom. It's just not straight thinking. The builder who discovered him believes that he tried to climb up from the inside, but that doesn't explain the breakfast bar or his clothes. Was he forced up there by another person? Or did he just make a series of bad decisions? We may never know. On the 1st of August, 2022, a man named Muthu Kumar, who we'll call Muthu, had reportedly been in charge in overseeing the preparation of porridge for an upcoming festival in India. The sticky sweet concoction was being prepared in large metal containers in the middle of the street with no lids. Muthu can be seen swaying back and forth. He's clearly going through some sort of phase, so he holds onto the wall for support. And while he's in this haze, he looks desperately around for a seat. Captured on CCTV, in what looks like a moment of poor judgment, Muthu decides to perch on the side of a boiling porridge vat. Passerbys looked at him in confusion, knowing that he was so close to falling in, and one even reached out to ask if he was okay. But before anyone could assist, Muthu attempted to fully seat himself on the porridge. He overshot it and plunged straight into the sticky, boiling mess, submerging up to the neck in the stuff. Now submerged in boiling liquid, Muthu went into complete shock. He tried to pull himself out, but every surface that he touched was scalding. He just completely froze in panic. Many people rushed to his aid, pulling at his arms to help him, but he had fallen into such an awkward position. Muthu was conscious throughout, as five to six people worked to heave him out of the barrel. But they didn't want to get burnt themselves. They pulled and pulled, and eventually the entire porridge vat fell over into the street, ejecting Muthu to the ground. People watched as he tried to stand up, and it was clear to see that he couldn't believe what had just happened. While he was able to walk away from the scene, his burns were catastrophic. He had the worst degree of burns on 95% of his body. They rushed him to hospital, but sadly, he passed away that night. Police's initial investigations found that Muthu did suffer from epilepsy, but they couldn't be sure if he was experiencing an episode when he stumbled. On Sunday, July the 23rd, 2006, the day started like any other for many residents of the county of Durham, England. In Durham is a park called the Riverside Park. This park is a large stretch of grass that has always been popular with visitors as it was often used to hold art exhibitions for touring art companies and bands. However, that weekend, something special had come to Riverside Park. It was an inflatable sculpture known as Dream Space. Dream Space was created in 1996 by British sculptor Maurice Aegis. Dream Space, along with his other pieces of art, toured across Europe and was seen by thousands. Maurice and his team arrived on Saturday the 22nd to set up the sculptures and open them to the public the next day. That Sunday morning, it was bright and sunny with a light breeze, eventually attracting around 500 people to see his art. Of course, Dream Space was the main attraction. The sculpture was indeed something that you don't see every day. It was a giant towering abstract maze that you could explore and walk around. It was made out of rubber and inflated similarly to a bouncy castle. It measured a massive 112 yards. It boggled the eye just looking at it. As the day went on, 
the wind slowly started to pick up, but they prepared for this. Maurice told his employees to secure it with more rope to the moorings. As Maurice made this commandment, he left the scene for a tea break. Within moments of him leaving, pure pandemonium broke out. While the inflatable structure was tied to the ground with ropes and moorings, it proved totally insufficient. Around 3.30 that afternoon, the structure rose and one by one, the peg snapped and came out of the ground. Many people who were inside at the time were forced to leap out as it gained altitude. Staff fought to keep it on the ground and even Maurice came out to assist holding it down. But even with around 40 men still holding it, they stood no chance. A summer storm had built and huge gusts of wind began to carry the structure up to 30 feet in the air. This is footage from the incident. People watched as this gargantuan structure drifted through the air. It then hit the CCTV camera and began tumbling into a nearby car park. But what goes up must come down. After some solid air time, the structure plummeted to the ground, where staff rushed in to provide aid. It was total chaos. In total, 13 people were injured and multiple children suffered punctured lungs, broken ribs, not to mention internal bleeding. The most catastrophic of injuries was sustained by a 39-year-old woman named Claire and a 68-year-old woman named Elizabeth. They had been crushed in the fall while they were inside. They were rushed to the nearest hospital, but sadly, they both died that evening. When staff were questioned, they said that they'd witnessed the structure blowing at least two feet into the air the previous days and even on that Sunday. They reported it to Maurice and he was aware, but nothing was done. In 2009, Maurice, the creator, was charged with negligent manslaughter. And after a four week trial, he was found not guilty. He was, however, charged £10,000 for breaching health and safety rules. Maurice said that this affected him greatly and said that he would never build anything like Dream Space again. But as fate had it, he would never get the chance, as he also died just two months later in 2009. This tragic yet bizarre death begins in the Emerald City of Seattle, more specifically the Seattle-Tacoma International Airport. Now on August the 10th, 2018, around 2.36 p.m., a 29-year-old man named Richard Russell, also known as Bebo, clocked in for his shift at Seattle Airport. Richard worked at the airport as an air ground service agent for the last four years. He and his team were responsible for the luggage and the actual towing of the planes on the runway. While he was known to be quiet, he was very well liked by his peers. On that fateful day, something snapped in Richard's mind. After clocking in, Richard could be seen on CCTV going through the staff security gate, wearing a t-shirt reading, The Sky's No Limit. He then grabs his rucksack and continues on through. He then heads towards the toilets where he spends the next five hours doing who knows what. Five hours later, Richard emerges from the toilet and immediately heads towards plane cargo one at the north end of the airport. Around quarter past seven, Richard can then be seen on CCTV arriving at plane cargo one. Here he begins hitching a Bombardier Q400, a turboprop commercial aircraft that seated 76 people up to his tow buggy. Then all captured on CCTV, you can see Richard towing the plane all by himself towards the runway. Once it's in position, Richard leapt out of his buggy and ran towards the still rolling plane. He quickly flung open the door and hopped inside. And just like that, the plane began to roll down the runway. As he did this, air traffic control began to sense that something wasn't quite right. They requested that the pilot read out their call sign multiple times, but they got no response. It was all silent until Richard contacted air control saying, Seattle ground, uh, horizon guy, um, about to take off, it's gonna be crazy. Soon after this communication, with zero flight experience under his belt, Richard just took off. Upon witnessing a plane being hijacked, the emergency bell was raised. Seattle airport allowed no other planes to leave and two F-15 Eagle fighters scrambled to intercept the aircraft. Both were armed with two air-to-air -air missiles. There's an emergency situation going on and uh, FAA Tower is not accepting any uh, aircraft right now and not letting anybody depart. 
car, you need to call and scramble now. Air traffic control immediately demanded that he landed the plane. Richard replied that he wanted to do a few tricks before landing. All right, um, yeah, I just kind of want to do a couple maneuvers, see what it can do before I put it down, you know? As he began to gain altitude, he could be seen from the ground performing various tricks, loop-de-loops, spinning and contorting the plane as if he was playing Grand Theft Auto. He was flying completely upside down at one point, causing him to be violently sick in the cabin. I'm sorry, say that again. Sorry, uh, my mic came, came off. I threw up a little bit. Air traffic control contacted the plane again, but not all is what it seemed. Richard told them that he was a broken guy, got a few screws loose, I guess, I never really knew until now. He went into some detail about pay, but it sounded like Richard was just completely sick of the everyday routine. Those on the ground asked him if he needed help, and Richard responded. Do you seem comfortable with that? Oh, hell yeah, it's a blast, man. I've played video games before, so I, uh, you know, I know what I'm doing a little bit. The two F-15s attempted to direct the aircraft towards the Pacific Ocean and did not fire at it. They tried and tried to convince him to crash the plane into the ocean. Still, the plane continued soaring as Richard headed towards a sparsely populated island called Ketron Island, located 25 miles southwest of the airport. Towards the end, the aircraft was seen performing an epic barrel roll, recovering a mere 10 feet or 3 meters over the water. A veteran pilot said the maneuvers seemed pretty well executed without either stalling or pulling the wings off. Around one hour and 15 minutes after takeoff, at 8.43 local time, Richard could be heard getting emotional, saying that he is running low on fuel. He then apologized to his friends and family before slamming the plane into Ketron Island. The impact completely obliterated the aircraft, causing it to explode in a plume of smoke and flames, killing Richard instantly. The fire burnt up to the evening of the next day. A review of his text messages sent during the incident, so like actually while he was piloting the plane, did not indicate that he had any terrorist ideology. However, investigators did receive information regarding his background that pointed to high stress levels and a rough personal life. But there was no clear element that provided a motivation for his actions. This situation may not have happened if Richard had just reached out for help. As tragic as his death was, he could have dealt a lot more damage if he decided he wanted to. Richard's manager said that the aerial maneuvers were incredible and that he did not know how he achieved the experience that he did, concluding that Richard probably trained himself using amateur flight simulation software. Russell's family released a statement on August the 11th stating that they were stunned and heartbroken and devastated by the events that unfolded. While researching this, I found Richard's personal blog. If you're interested, I'll link that in the description below, as I do with all references. Now this one genuinely gave me nightmares. I woke up in a cold sweat, hoping that this never, ever happens to me. In 2015, deep in the heart of Houston, Texas, lived a 61-year-old woman named Mary Saruti. Pictured here, Mary lived alone with her cats. She hung tapestries on the window to maintain her privacy and was the kind of person that just kept to herself. She lived a very secluded life and her closest relatives were cousins who lived across state. So she just lived day by day, pottering on. She didn't really receive phone calls, nor did anyone really check up on her. In summer of 2015, her neighbors started to become concerned after they noticed the mail began to pile up in front of her house. They also noticed a front window broken, yet it was not repaired for weeks. Finally, on the 5th of May, 2015, Mary was reported missing by her friends after she stopped returning calls. The police rocked up to her house and investigated. They found her car still in the drive, but Mary was nowhere to be seen. They searched the house, but there was nothing. No evidence, no leads, poof. Mary had just disappeared. Her bank accounts had not been used and the house was left untouched. A year later, still nothing. Her house became overgrown, trees and bushes began covering the front porch, all while her car rotted in the driveway. 
As the bank did not receive mortgage payments, two years later, the house was formally repossessed. The bank cleared up the property, cut away the bushes and put it up for rent. And within days, a young couple had moved in and it seemed like the perfect home. Until this 911 call was received. I didn't know exactly how to do it, but I just moved into this house. I'm renting it. Uh, just moved in a couple days ago and I found between two of the walls, uh, I found a human skeleton. The new homeowners found a rat infested skeleton jammed in a 15 to 20 inch space behind the bathroom wall. The police told the homeowner to remain where he was and not disturb the scene. When authorities arrived, it was clear to see that the remains had been there for a long time. So long, in fact, her cause of death could not be determined. Along with the gnawed bones, laid tattered clothing, rotten shoes, and last but not least, her glasses. This exact pair she could be seen wearing in this 2013 footage at a community event. Hi, my name is Mary Sarudi and I live at 610 Alston. After extensive, and I mean extensive, DNA testing, the bones were finally confirmed to be Mary's. She had been trapped between these two walls for two years. When they went up to check the attic, they found a broken floorboard right above where she fell. They deduced that she must have entered the attic and slipped through the wall, and just like that, the house became her tomb. By looking at the photos, the drop doesn't look that significant, so it's likely she survived the fall only to find herself well and truly stuck. The tiny space was so small that she wouldn't have been able to even move an inch forward or back. Trapped between these two walls, it was like a sound chamber. Here she was stuck for who knows how long, until she likely succumbed to dehydration. Absolutely horrifying. Hundreds, if not thousands of people walked past this house, not knowing she was inside. The bank even cleaned up and sold the house and didn't notice. This whole ordeal makes me want to scream. The thought of being trapped in a space where you physically can't move an inch forward or back, screaming endlessly, knowing nobody is going to hear you, knowing that you may never be discovered. It has to be one of the worst deaths imaginable. My initial questions are, if she entered the attic, surely she must have left the ladder down. Was this not a good enough hint? Perhaps the police closed it or who knows? Mary's remains were finally removed from the house in 2017, and I hope that she is at peace now. May all the victims of this video rest in peace. But that is the end of the video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments below. I say this in every video, but I do read every single one. And just before I go, if you're into true horror content, and if you look down there and you're not subscribed, go and tap that subscribe button now. But I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.